worthy to be praised. Righteous Father, we say thank you. Holy Father, we say thank you. We bless the beauty of your holiness. It is because of you we are not consumed. The arrows that fly in the day, those that fly at night, the pestilence of darkness, you have not suffered us to have encounter with them because you have terminated them. This is the moment of truth. The time we've been waiting for. Father, send down your word that will make a difference in our life in the mighty name of Jesus. Give us your season word that we turn our story around. Is there any blind person here? Let that person see in this service. Let the lame walk. Those looking for a change of status, let there be a turnaround in this service in the mighty name of Jesus. Above all, we pray for the spirit of wisdom. We pray for revelation knowledge. Let our eyes of understanding be enlightened as your word come powerfully in this service. Put wisdom in our minds. Put understanding in our hearts. All this we ask in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Let's give Jesus a round of applause and a shout of hallelujah. As we take our seat in heavenly places. Say to your neighbor on your left and right, you are welcome to Living God Covenant Church. You'll be glad that you're in this service because God is said to bless you afresh in the mighty name of Jesus. David said, I was glad when they say, let's go to the house of God. Because the house of God is a place of merriment. It's a place of refreshing. And I know God will refresh you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Be enlightened with the light of the living. For his mighty power. Wonderful. That is your portion and portion in the mighty name of Jesus. Every one of us, we shall be enlightened with the light of the living for his mighty power. This morning, I was seriously blessed while in the opening worship prayer. It was powerful. God's presence was mighty. And even when the choir came, the voice of true choir, they re-echo the worship song again. I want to know you more and more. The secret about the agape love of God is for you to know him. You cannot love what you don't know. And that is why that worship song says, I want to know you. And the more I want to know you, the more I want to know you. Every one of us, we are in this world to know God and to know Jesus. To know God and to know Jesus. And we must crave for that. We must love that. We especially selected where we read John 14, a very powerful scripture. We read this morning. Because John 14 is loaded. It has a lot of information that we need to help our Christian life. But in our usual manner, we like to take it one after the other. Today's sermon is 873. For those following our series, Psalm 873. Psalm 873. And the topic is understanding love for its mighty power. It is subtitled Covenant Day of Increased Love for its mighty power. Say after me, Covenant Day of Increased Love for its mighty power. Wonderful. Love has been an enigma. A puzzle. Christians have been finding it difficult to understand love. And every true Christian must understand love. Because Christianity is about the love of God. After Jesus Christ left, after the death of Jesus Christ, Peter said, let's go fishing. He abandoned the ministry. And he carried some other disciples and they went fishing. And when Jesus Christ came to meet him, Jesus Christ spoke to him thrice. 
and say, Peter, does that love me more than this? All this fishing, you are fishing. And Peter said, you know I love you. <laughs> and he repeated it again. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. You cannot claim to love God when you don't love the things of God. The things of God doesn't switch you. You can't claim to love God. And you cannot love God without knowing. My lifetime mentor, Bishop David Oyedipo said, <laughs> people ask him, what is the secret of this your exploit? All these things you are doing so wonderfully well. What is the secret? And he told them, he said, look, you cannot know my secret until you know the love I have for God. The, my heart beats for God. How much I love God. And he tried to explain it. He said, I love God more than myself. I love God more than my wife. I love God more than my children. So I love God more than anything. It's only God that I know. You can now see where my blessings are coming from. It's only you know my heart beat for God. And every lover of God, ooh, God does not disappoint his lovers. God will always favor his lovers. Once you are a lover of God, yeah, the favor of God will rest upon you. The Bible let us know. He said, if a man ways pleases God, he will even make his enemies to be at peace with him. If your way pleases God. Salvation is a gift. It's a gift of God. But to love God <laughs> is not a gift. It's a choice. It's a decision. And that is why you see many people that have gotten the gift of salvation. The love of God is inside them. But they cannot manifest it. They can manifest it because they have not made that decision. It's a decision. That you are in church today is a decision. You have many places you would have been. There are many places you would like to go and all of that. But you make it say today, I want to be in the church. I want to be in this church. Living God covenant church. It's a decision. We are told in Joy Terry, verse 14. He said, multitude, multitude are in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is at hand. Not knowing what to do. Should I take left or should I take right? Or should I go straight? Mankind is always making decisions. And whatever decision you make, is either leading you forward or leading you backward. If you make right decisions, you move forward. You make wrong decisions, you go back. And that is why when you continue to make wrong decisions, you are going back, 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 back. When you continue to make right decisions, you are going forward, forward. As Christians, we are supposed to make righteous decisions. Right decision always. So we move forward. Proverbs 4 verse 18. It's in the path of the just. It's as a shining light that will shine brighter, brighter. Forward ever, backward never. I this how it is for every Christian. And even when you see them, you think they are going down. That things are not good for them. Things are good for them. You don't know. You are not seeing it in the spirit realm. You are not seeing it in the spirit realm. And that's why Romans 8, 28 made it clear. He said, all things work together for what? For good. To them that love the Lord. All you need, the love of God, is to love God. It's to love God. And it's a decision. You have to make that decision. Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself. He will not pollute himself with the meat of the king and all the pleasantry of the king and all that. No! 
because of his love for God. And because of that, Hayala, God caused those that are in charge of him to favor him. And I had a tender favor from them. Because he proposed in his heart. He made a decision. Moses did the same thing. You forgot to Moses? Moses was in the king palace. But because of the love that he has for his people. Because of the love that he has for his people. He said no. He has to abandon where he was. And because of that love. He killed an Egyptian. He's like I cannot see his people being molested. Harassed anyhow. And that cost him the, 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 the gravity he was enjoying. And he became a fugitive, a wanderer. But God looked at him. Because that is the heart God wants. You have to love God. You love God and love his people. Moses had a heart for his people. The same thing with Moses. Um, Moses, the same thing if you look at all of them. Because of that heart that they have, God said, this is the man. This is the man. Because he has a heart for his people. David, the same thing. Hayala. God testified concerning David. Can God give a testimony concerning you? He said, I found David, my servant, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and I know he will surely do all my will. Hayala. God is testifying about a man. David. He said, I know him. And that is why he swore to David. He said, David, I swore to you. The covenant will remain in your lineage because of my love for you. The covenant will not depart from you. But your children, they must keep my covenant. And as far as they keep my covenant, the lineage it will not find that the son of man which is coming is going to come out. The king of kings is going to come. And that was how it was. Jesus came from the lineage of David because of the love David has for God. What about Solomon? Hayala. Solomon. We are told in 1 Samuel 3. Solomon loved the Lord. Woo! Because of the love, he gave a thousand bond offering. You cannot love and not give. People that are not giving is because they don't love. If you don't give, you don't love. A man that loves a woman, hayala, genuine love, agape love, hayala, you can give anything. You can give anything. And that is why the Bible said the greatest love you can think of is for a man to give his life. That is the ultimate love. For a man to die for another. And that's what God has done. It's the ultimate love for a man to die for another. Say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Now we have seen in our previous sermon that Jesus Christ is the foundation of what? Our true love. The agape love. But this morning, the food God has prepared for us, we want to learn how can we increase that love? How can we maximize that love? Because for every true lover of God, you have to maximize that love. You have to increase the love. You don't stay where you are. You must move from one level to another. Eternal Jesus. And as you do that, God will bless you abundantly. Because God blesses his lovers. Secrets of the kingdom are revealed to lovers. They show me 29, 29. It's every secret belongs to the Lord. And he reveal it to whomsoever he wants to reveal it to. And when he do, it's for that person and his generation to run with it, to enjoy it. First Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. He said, eyes have not seen, neither has it entered the ears of men, the heart of men, the things God has prepared for those that love him. He said, but he has revealed it to his lovers. God will always reveal secret to his lover. Was Abraham not a lover of God? <laughs> God said, can I do this thing without telling my friend Abraham? Abraham graduated from, from servantship to friendship. 
The disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus looked at them. He said, ye are no longer my servant. Ye are my friends. Because secrets are revealed to friends. There are things you don't tell servants. But when you become a friend of God, woo -hoo, ah, yeah, things will be coming to you cheaply. Things will be coming to you. There are friends that are closer than brothers. Are you aware of that? Some friends are closer than brothers. You tell the person secrets. So you have to graduate from servanthood to friendship. So that secret will be revealed to you. You love God. Such that God will begin to reveal secret to you. The mind and more Jesus. Next Monday we want to look at how do we increase our love for God? We know from where we learn, well, from our previous study, we said advanced truth equals what? Advanced truth equals what? Wonderful. You are good disciples. Advanced truth equals advanced love. And we practicalize it in church. We say in a, imagine a pool. A pool of water. And the staircase is the truth. When you stay at the beginning of the pool, the brink, you will find out that the love you have is small. Small truth, small love. As you go down the staircase, you go down. You are going down the truth. Your truth is in green. Deep, color deep. As you are going down, the water of love is covering you, isn't it? If you go to a big pool, a pool that is 7 feet, 10 feet, 12 feet, you get to a point the water has covered you fully. And by the time that water covered you fully, you will see you've been swallowed up. No person can see you again. You are deep down the truth. Love has covered you. And this is what you hear Apostle Paul. And also, if you go to Apostle Paul said, he said, look, in Romans 8, verse 35, he said, who can separate me from the love of God? <laughs> when he died, he said, who can remove me from the love of God? He said, is it death? Is it life? Is it height? Is it, he said, what? Is it persecution? Is it, he said, nothing. Me and the love of God, we go hold each other, get it back. No way. Nothing. Because he understood. That the love is everything. See, what can separate me from the love? Nothing. And also, if you go to 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he also expressed it there. He said, the love of Christ constraineth us and we thus judge. If one die for all, then we are all dead. And that is why I've always advocated. I said, look, Christianity is what? A suicide mission in Christ. If you don't know, know it. It's a suicide mission in Christ. A true Christian. You see like we have all those people that say they are fundamentalists. Eh? They carry bomb. They carry everything and all of that. Put it out. They say they are going for suicide mission to kill themselves. That is how Christianity is. Jesus said, if you want to save your life, you lost it. But if you surrender totally to him, you give him your life, you allow the love of Christ to swallow you, then your life will be safe. And that was why he said, if you look at uh, Paul Apostle, he said, look, the love of Christ constrains and we just judge. Because one died for all, we are all dead men. We no longer live according to ourselves. We live according to that one which died for us. He said, we have known Christ after the flesh. But know ye not. We no longer know him after the flesh. We know him after the spirit. Because a carnal man is a dead man. But a spiritual man is alive. You have to know Christ after the spirit. And that's why true Christianity is a worship of what? You worship Christ in truth and in spirit. Not after the flesh. Anyone that doesn't have the spirit of Christ in is none of his. So you see it. And if you go to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. 
He now made the seventh thing. He said, if any man be in Christ, if any man be in the love of Christ, if you enter the love pool of Christ, is a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. When people see you, they don't see you again. They see Christ. When you arrive, it is Christ that have arrived. He said, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. Who are you? So when they see you, they see Christ. Ah. So is it? Because you've been transformed. You've been transformed. And the problem, you see, to love God is not an easy thing. It's difficult. It is difficult to love God. You must understand the genesis. If you see where we read, the scripture we read in John 14, it was a big problem. Even the disciples of Jesus Christ, they could not understand. Because from where they are coming from, all the while, God has been telling them, if you look at when they came out from, from Egypt and all of that, God has been with them. They have known God the Father. No other God, that is God the Father they've been serving since. Now, somebody came, John the Baptist, and begin to tell them, one is coming that is going to baptize them in the spirit and Jesus. Did you understand it? They are looking at John the Baptist like a native. That, what, what is this one saying? Which prophet is this? Several prophets have come. Jeremiah have come. As I have come. All of them. They have said concerning Jesus. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. He said, the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Almighty God, Wonderful Counselor, the Prince of Peace. He said, to the increase of his government, there shall be no end. He's talking, people do not understand what he's saying. What is he saying? In Isaiah 11, Isaiah said in 11, he said, look, a stem, a rod will come out of the stem of uh, Jesse. You understand? He said, and in him, you will have the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of quick understanding in the fear of God. And it shall be a tree of righteousness. What are you saying? You'll be the more you look, the less you, you, are, you they don't even understand what he's saying. What is he saying? What is this one saying? It's difficult. So people did not understand. Until that Jesus himself they are talking about now arrive. We are told in John 1 verse 14. He said the word which is Jesus was made flesh and dwell among us. The only begotten. They were looking at him. He came to his own and his own knew him not. People did not recognize. They don't know him. He started telling them. He said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God has come. Who is the kingdom? Is it not him? He has come. The kingdom of God. That person they are talking has come. The Messiah has come. Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God. Look, where do they talk? I mean, uh, John the Baptist, they tell us all these things. You don't start again. Who be this one? And they were looking at him. They don't understand. And even the people, the inner caucus, in our carry, his disciples and others, those who are following him, following me all about, they've been with him three years. They still do not even understand what he's saying. Because they have been trained. They have knowledge. All those, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes, the, the Jewish people, they have knowledge to love the Father. Follow the Father. That's what they've trained them for. Obey the laws. Obey everything, the commandment, and they struggle to obey the law. But the law is a problem. God said in Romans 3, verse uh, uh, 19, He said, He gave them a law that they cannot keep, so that everyone will become guilty before Him. Everyone will become an offender. So you see it. So Jesus came. If you see where we read in that John 14, look at the drama going on. Let us Matthew read for us. Start from John 14. You see, there was a problem of what they believe. They believe God, but they don't believe Jesus. John 14, read from 1. He was telling them, don't let your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. Believe in God and believe also in me. Uh -huh. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my father's house are many mushrooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. If I go prepare a place for you, I will come again. 
and receive you unto myself. For where I am, here you may be also. And where are they go, you know. And the way to go there, you know. Look at the people he's talking to. One of his disciples. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know, know where you go. <laughs> how can we know the way? Where you say we go, we don't know. And how can we know the way? Uh -huh. Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. If ye had known me. Oh la la la. You see, they are with him, but they don't know him. He said, if ye had known me. Are you getting it? They are with him, but they don't know him. If ye have known me, you would have known the Father. Continue. Yes. Read that again. You are, you read about that again. If he had known me, he should have known the father. If you know the father, uh, the son, you will know the father. Uh -huh. And from henceforth, ye know, know him. And I've seen him. Hold on, hold on. Let's explain that. This is a big problem. Now, Jesus, they were telling Jesus to show them the way. Thomas wrote was bold enough. So look, Jesus said, you know the way and all of that. If somebody they will keep quiet. But Thomas cannot keep quiet. Thomas have to speak out. He said, look, we don't know the way. Show us the way. We don't know the way. He said, ah, you don't know the way. I'm the way now. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one cometh to my father except through me. You understand? So, now, he now said, look, if you have known me, because you people don't know me, you will know the father. You understand? You will know the father. And you will know that the father is in me and in the father. You understand? Then they now say, it's okay for now. You now know the father. Because if you have known me, you now know the father. He was telling them. Look at what they answer, Thomas answered. Uh, Philip, Philip. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father. It's enough for us. He said, the father is suffice it for us. They like the father. Where well, well. This one, forget that. We don't know. The father is where the one we like. Show us the father. The father is suffice it for us. It's sufficient for us. We like the father. Because that is how they've been training them since father. This is Jesus. We don't know him. Who he be? We don't know. He just a talk. Say me the son of God. And this thing annoyed Jesus. <laughs> Look at Jesus' response. Jesus, Jesus said to him, have I been so long time with you? And yet, has that not known me? I don't stay with you people for three years, and yet you don't know me? Philip. He that have seen me, as you have seen me, you have seen the Father. How can you be asking me then, say, where the Father? She was the Father. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, Jesus went into jail. He said, believe it not that I'm in the Father. And the Father is in me. The word that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. It's the Father that dwelleth in me that is speaking it. He's doing the works. Hey, wait. This is a strong one. At this time, they were just looking at Jesus. They were confused. You can sit down. Thank you very much. They were confused. They didn't understand. Which level? Where this man is? Who be this? What is he saying? And this has been the problem. Jesus know the problem. The problem is that they believe God. But they don't believe Jesus. That is the problem. And anyone that says he believed God and does not believe his son, he called God a liar. Because God has testified that this is the only begotten son. That everyone should believe him. So you see the problem. And Jesus went, start talking. By the time we read, you begin to see all the things Jesus is saying. That if you don't believe Jesus, then you don't have life. Because Jesus is the life. He said, as the father have life in him, so the father have given the son life. It is the son that have the authority to give people life. Every person is a dead person. 
It is the son that gives life to people. And this, once you know the son, you will have life. If you don't know the son, no life. And this was what I exemplify in John 17, verse 2 and 3. Let somebody read John 17, 2 and 3. Let's see. Please be fast. Let's move. Listen, oh, Jesus was telling. He said, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that Jesus should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal. That they might know thee. Look at it. You need to underline the truth. The only true God and Jesus Christ who thou have sent. Thank you very much. You see the problem now. So they have fake God. They have true God. In this world that we are in now, there are fake God. There are, there, we have fake gods. And many people believe in that fake God. The God of sun, the God of moon, the God of all manners of things, the God of star, the God of this different God. Orion God. There are many gods. There are many goddesses. There are different kinds of gods. People believe in different gods. Shango, Oloku, all manners of things. People believe in them. So you see it. And when you believe in all those things and all of that, without believing his son, you cannot. That is why he said, you cannot get to God without me. I'm the intermediary. I'm the middle person. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that is why in this church, it is called to us. The way, the truth, and life is pillars to us. They are very strong. The way, the truth. Everyone that is, is it not heaven you want to go? Are you not planning to go and meet the father? And he said the only way to the father, he's in. So there's no other place. There is no other shortcut. He is the shortcut. So any other thing, once you are going after any other God, because if you go and meet other religion now, if you go online, they said we have over 152 religion online internet. Check it, say religion. And that's why as Christians, we usually we are annoyed. We don't want to call Christianity a religion. Because religion has been bastardized. When you say religion, say which one you did? Now the Christian you be, I've been uh, this, I've been because uh, religion many. Now voodoo, now this, religions are so many. Many that you can't add Christianity to join them. So we refuse. And why we are saying no, it's not a religion and all of that. Can you call the relationship between you and your son a religion? It's not a religion because Christianity is a relationship between a father and a son. That is it. So we don't call it, it's not a religion. We don't want to accept. But if they give you a book to fill now, you go for examination, they say, what is your religion? You will put Christianity now, isn't it? You just put for them, but you know better. Huh? You just put for them. Because you know better. So Christianity is beyond religion. It's beyond religion. And it's beyond faith. Or it's not faith, faith. Because all other religions, they'll tell you it's faith-based religion. Go and ask them. It's faith. Every religion is faith. What is faith? You are serving a God you are not seeing. Are you getting it? You are serving a God you are not seeing. Have you seen God before? So you see it. So now the problem is belief. Who do you believe? The two key problems we have as a Christian is belief and know. Believing and knowing. They are not the same. Believing and knowing. So Jesus was addressing the issue of belief. He said, believe in God. Believe also in me. Because God has committed everything to his son. If you don't believe his son, you are just wasting time. We saw yesterday in John, uh, was it yesterday? John 5, verse 22, 23. We saw it there. That he has given his son everything. That his son is the judge. He's going to judge everything. And the same honor you give him, give to his son. And his son is the one that has life, that gives life to people. It is the son that gives life to people. God has given that power to give life to people. So you see it. So you must accept him as your Lord and personal Savior. And this was what Moses, if you re recall, Moses said this long ago in Deuteronomy. You remember Deuteronomy 30, verse 19 and 20. When Moses gathered the children of Israel, he was telling them about Jesus, but they didn't know. You remember he said, he said, I call heaven. They've, they've been provoking Moses. They've been annoying Moses. Moses doesn't know what to, how to handle these people. He gathered me together and said, look, 
So hear, the, hear the word of God today. He said, I call heaven this day to be a record between me and you. That look, God has said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He said, but I advise you, choose life. He said that you may live. You and your children and we could not live. Choose life. He didn't stop there. He went to 20. He said, look, obey the commandment of God. Are you getting it? Obey the commandment of God. He said, cleave to it. Be joined to it. Joined to it. He said, because he's the life. You see, it? the word of God is the life. Obey the word of God. He said, cleave to it because he's the life. He said, the length of your days is in him. How long you will stay in this world is depending on what Jesus said, what God said. And that was why when God sent Isaiah to go and tell King Ezekiel that today you will die. Prepare your household. You will die today. And when Isaiah got there and told King Ezekiel the bad news because he's been sick. He's been lying down on the bed and all of that. The king has been sick. But King Ezekiah know the secret of God. He knows the secret of God. He knows the secret of longevity for you to live long. They said Ezekiah turned to the wall. In that his bed sleeping, he turned to the wall. Because he can't even get up from bed. He turned to the wall and cried to God. He said, oh God. If I die, I go down the grave. Who will praise you? Who will declare your truth? He said, only the living shall praise you. Only the living shall declare your truth. As I live, you know I used to declare your truth. You know I used to praise you. Ah! He wept, he cried. This time Isaiah has turned back, he's going. The Lord said, who be this man? Ah. Isaiah, go back, go back, go back. This man has touched some area that I like. Go back, go and tell him. Say, I give you 15 years more. I gave him 15 years more to live. And as I turned back, imagine if you are the prophet. It is you that went to announce death. You don't go. They say, go back, go announce 15 years more. <laughs> and as I went back and told him, he said, God said, you will not die. That he has heard you and all of that. King Ezekiah knows the secret of the kingdom. He knows God loved the truth. God loved truth and God loved praise. He inhabited the praise of his people. So Ezekiel is telling the sweet, sweet thing that he likes. He said, oh, we praise you. You know I used to praise you. You know I used to declare your truth. God loved truth. The Bible says you can do nothing against the truth, but for what? The truth. So when he spoke the truth to God, hi, Allah, it is sweet God. I said, yes. My son, you go still live. Don't worry. You will live. Because God loved people that praise him, that glorify him, that give honor to him. He loved them. So Ezekiel had to live another 15 years because of the secret. He knew the secret of long, longevity. He knew how to live long. You know one secret to live long? Say, obey your father and your mother. Another one is to love the truth, declare the truth. Praise God. A praiser does not die. He will live. When you praise God, can't you see David? David was old. David lived very old. Why? He's a psalmist. He knows the secret. Always singing praises for God. Always dancing. And that's why God left him. He old, he ran, 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 became very old. Or don't you want to live old? <laughs> he was a friend of God. We pray God goes on Sunday, the mighty name of Jesus. So now, you must, there's issue of belief and the issue of knowing. What is belief? Belief is to accept Something as true. But the thing may not be true. It's just like you talk. I say, I believe you. What you are saying may be lie. I don't know. Belief is accepting something as true. That is belief. To believe. Somebody says, I believe him. The person may be telling lies, but you say you believe him. To accept anything as true, you believe in that thing. And usually you see it. It could be in Christianity. It could be anything. I believe this person. I believe that. I believe this. I believe. When you believe something, it doesn't mean the thing is true. You could believe it. 
And that's why I believe it's very powerful. Now, what is knowing? Hayala, that is where the problem comes. When you know something, that thing, you have knowledge of it, that it is true. Are you getting it? You have not, you know that that thing is true. That thing is factual. That thing is correct. That you don't just say, okay, let me give you an example. You can see someone say, oh, I know the mother. I know this person's mother. But the father, I don't know the father. Why do you know the mother? You have met the mother. You've seen the mother. I know the mother of this person. But the father, I don't know the father. I can also, because I know the mother, I know the father. Are you seeing it? That was the problem they were having. They claim to know God, but they don't want Jesus. <laughs> they don't want Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus is the problem. And that's why the Jewish people, they say, they look at Jesus. They say, you are a stumbling block. We want to serve our God. You have come to, 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 to block the road for us. They say, Jesus is a stumbling block, a rock of offense. Why the Jewish, uh, the, the Greek, say Jesus, to, to be following Jesus is foolishness. The Greek are the wise people. They say following Jesus is foolishness. And the Jews say it's a, rock, it's a stumbling block. Because they don't want him. They don't need him. They say let's serve God direct. We want to serve our God direct. They want Moses told us. And that's why if you read, you see Moses, Jesus was annoyed. If you read that scripture all the day, Jesus said, look at you. The Moses you people love, this Moses, he's always accusing you people before God. And you people, they say they trust him. They like him. This Moses. If you read the Bible, you see Moses. Moses was annoyed with him. You say, you stiff-necked people. You, this is what is going to happen to you. God will destroy you people. God will destroy you people. <laughs> Go and read. When you read, when you read the Trinity 30, 31, I love that. Moses was annoyed. <laughs> he said, you don't hear what. You, don't, you are stiff-necked. You are this. Jesus said, I'm seeing you. He's doing all this to you. You people still love him. You trust him. Me! That is telling you the truth. You do not love me. You don't trust me. If you go to John 8, verse 40, they told you, say, look. He said, why can't you people believe me? Why can't you? He said, look. They said, we, 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 they said you, we don't believe you. You understand? That we are children of Abraham. He said, look at you, children of Abraham. If you are children of Abraham, you understand? You will love me. You will believe in me. You understand? You are not children of Abraham. He said, your father is the devil. The works of your father you will do. You understand? You are not children of Abraham. Because if you are truly children of Abraham, you will know me. I come out of God. It is God that sent me. Why can't you be children of Abraham? You know, you're not children of Abraham. Because they say we are not slaves. We are not born people. We are, we are children. If you, you begin to, you see them insulting each other. It's painful. He said, why can't you understand me when I talk to you? You people cannot understand. How can they understand? They can't understand. He said, you people want to kill me. Why do you want to kill me? What are you killing me for? Is it for the, the miracle I did? Or not? They say, no, we like the miracle you are doing. It's not a miracle we are killing for. We are, we are not happy with you because you say you are the son of God. That is our problem with you. How can man be the son of God? That is our area. We don't like you. you how can you, a man call himself the son of God? You are not the son of God. You see the problem? <laughs> <laughs> now look at the, not to talk of his own inner caucus his disciples they are having problems <laughs> it's a serious matter huh? so these are the issues that we are going on and all these things need to be. if you want to increase your love for God you must first of all the first thing that you need to do is to know the true God say know the true God that is the first thing you must know the true God People must have told you about God. You must have heard about God. You've been hearing about God. You can be in church. You've been attending church for 20 years, 30 years and you don't know God. Please, beloved of God, listen. You can be in church. They will say, praise the Lord. You say, praise the Lord. Even winches, they say, praise the Lord. Winches and wizards, they will praise the Lord. You think winches don't come to church? They come. They will sit at the back. They don't like front. Because front, the world can hit them too fast. <laughs> <laughs> and when the service is getting hot, they, they, they run out. <laughs> no witch we like to come and say in front. They are usually afraid of <laughs> I'm not saying people at the back are witches. <laughs> eh? I'm not saying so. Everywhere, this is the house of God. No witch can survive here. Jesus. 
This is the living God covenant church through Chapel International. Now, you see, you must know the true God. And that was what uh, Jesus was saying in John 17 verse 2. He said that they may know you, the only true God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom thou have sent. So you must know God. And I've said, you can be in church and not know God. What does it prove that you know God? A lot of people, if you go to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 3, 1 Samuel 3 verse 1, let us read 1 Samuel 3 verse 1, you read that for us and you read verse 7. Let me show you something. A man that was in the church, he was even a minister of God in the church, but yet he does not know God. He was in the church. You understand? His mother dedicated him to the church. He, he lives in the church. He, the church is in his house. He lives there. He sleeps in the church. And all, but this man does not know God. Are you getting it? So it's not how well you go to church. You can go to church often and yet you don't know God. You've not had an encounter with God. Read for me. First uh, Samuel 3 verse 1. He said, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord. Samuel was in the church. He was a young minister of God. Because his mother has dedicated him to church. He was staying with Eli. Uh -huh. Before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. When I say precious, it was scarce. The word of the Lord was scarce. It's not easy to see. It's not easy. The word of the Lord was scarce in those days. Uh -huh. Why? There was no open vision. You know what vision? Vision is the word of God being released. There was no open vision. God was not speaking. When God sp speaks, that is vision. Whatever God says concerning anything is the vision of that thing. You understand? Abadiah 1 verse was 1. He said, look, the word that came to Abadiah. Are you getting it? When God speaks, that is vision. He said, thus hear the Lord. Thus hear the Lord. That is the vision of God concerning a particular thing. Okay? Go to 7. Now listen. He said, now someone had not yet known the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called somewhere again three times. Thank you. You can stop there. Now what I want you to see in that verse 7. 1 and 7. Samuel was a young minister of God. The mother has given him to Eli. They serve God. He was, he, he was there. Taking care of the altar, taking care of the... He was a church boy. You know, let's go church boy. He was a church boy. But we are saying now that he does not yet know God. And they said, not that he does not yet know God. God has not yet revealed himself to him. Until God reveal himself to you, you are just... Until he reveal himself to you. He will show you, you have encounter with him. You can be serving God. God has not, you've not yet had a encounter. Because when you have encounter with God, there must be difference. There is no one that have encounter. Look at from Genesis to Revelation. Everyone that have encounter with God, that person is changed. If God reveal himself, the day God is ready for you, say today, I'm ready for you. I'm visiting you today. You change. You transform. For many years, I was going to church. Many years. I grew up from a Christian home. My dad was a Christian. My mom was a Christian. We attended. We belong to the Anglican faith. But I have not yet had an encounter with God. I have not yet. It took me time before I had an encounter with God. So a time will come. Sometimes people are doing baptism. You join them and do baptism. You'll be doing all those things. You'll be doing everything. God has not ready. When God is ready for you. When God is ready for you. Only you. In fact, shame, you will throw away shame. I told you my experience. I've given my life to Christ, but I gave my life, my life again. It was in Gambia. Serekunda. Abiding world ministry. I cannot forget it. On one day like that. Because I was in, in Gambia. Serekunda. And I was in the church. It was a Ghanaian pastor that was preaching. They invited a Ghanaian pastor who was preaching that day. And I was among the crowd, just sat down, listening to the word of God. And this man started speaking, talking, and all of that. And he pointed, say you, that God mercy, that God mercy you have will disappoint you. I said, ah, mommy, they talked. Oh, who? who? <laughs> you know, a pastor would just do like this. I said, is it me or somebody else? And I was having God mercy. I just finished preparing God mercy. I want to travel to U.S. 
As soon as I get to US, they say they shoot people. When they shoot me, it will not enter. Just say, ta ta. I say, I'll be a superstar. <laughs> I've gone to do Gomez. <laughs> There's a place they do it is in Serikunda, in Gabia. I've done it. I was very happy with myself. As I'll be traveling with the Gomez into America. And this man was telling me, he said, that Gomez will disappoint you. He said, he, he didn't point to me. He was just pointing to the crowd. He said, look, that thing you are hoping of will disappoint you. They will shoot you, you will enter. This, I said, ah, this man, where did you <laughs> And he said, not just God inside saying differently, differently. And I was there. I was thinking. I said, ah, how did this man, this man know I have gone messy. This is it. And when it was time for altar call, he said, look, surrender yourself to God. Surrender, surrender yourself to God. Today, there might be no other opportunity. Do it now. And now people came. And I was just seated. I was thinking, should I go? Or should I not go? Should I go? Should I go? <laughs> Thank God he called again. He said, look, you, you don't want to come. Come on. <laughs> and I got up. So what have you? <laughs> and I gave out. And I gave, and I gave my life to Christ again. I've given my life to Christ before. But I just needed God mercy. <laughs> and that God mercy, if you know the God mercy, they do it locally. You will tie it around your waist. There is a very powerful message like this. <laughs> if you remove it from your waist, you put it around Papa tree. You can't even, you take knife to choke the Papa tree. It will bounce it back. If you hit it, it will not enter. The thing is so powerful. So, the man came and all of us, he now prayed for us. We gave our life to Christ again. He now used oil, pour oil on us and all of that. He said, look, whatever charm you have, whatever thing, when you go destroy it, destroy it. When I got home, I wasn't wearing the church. I kept it at home. It's not like it's with me. It's in, church, in at home. It's my special power that I'm going to carry to America. <laughs> when I got home, I, uh, I carried it. I said, oh, it's my God mercy. <laughs> it's God mercy. And I destroyed it. It was painful. <laughs> I destroyed the God mercy. So you see it. So we must be careful. There is a day for everyone. They say, would they, for anyone, where you will you give your life, you may be born again, you will not rededicate yourself, you will dedicate yourself to God. And God will begin to help you, begin to direct you in the mind, in the mind Jesus. There's a story of a man, it was in the this, in news, in Ibo side, that specialized in doing God mercy for people in Nigeria. This man has done God mercy for many people. And when they finish preparing it, they will test you, they will shoot you, tata, tata. The same thing in Gambia. After they've done it, they'll shoot you. They'll tell you to wear it. They'll shoot you. Tata. The bullet will not enter you. This man now, there are two brothers. They say very rich people. And they came to meet the man to do God mercy for them. So the man now did the God mercy for two of them. And they now tested it. And he gave you some Tata. Tata. The two of them just fell and died. Ah! <laughs> they arrested him. <laughs> The question I asked when I they arrested him, I said, What is this? The thing was in the news. How can you kill two brothers? Okay, you shoot one, that one fell. Won't you stop to shoot the other one? You should... <laughs> or you think he's played when he fell that he's played. Ah! So they arrested the man. They started investigating the police and all of that. The man had a problem with his wife. And the wife went and peace. They say urinate in the mercy. The message is strong, but the man so the message spoiled. And the man didn't know. So he was still doing it, doing it. He thought it's working. But when you kill the first person, you stop now. <laughs> so you see it. <laughs> but you see, every day for the thief, one day for the other. God wants two of them to die once. <laughs> he will remove sense. <laughs> so you see it. He will remove sense. So we have to be careful. All those things, they are temporary things. Yeah? They are temporary. You understand? They are temporary. They, they, you do them and all of that, but they are not good. People have God mercy. I'm saying people have. Not that they, they, they do have God mercy. But it's not of God. The real God mercy is what? It's Jesus. It's when you have Jesus. That is the God mercy you need. Am I hate about Jesus? Do you know why? You know, everything we say, there's always scripture. God mercy will protect you. Eh? But if Jesus is coming for you, will he protect you? <laughs> Jesus.
Jesus said, do not be afraid of the one that can destroy the body. But rather, the one that will destroy both the body and the spirit, the soul, in hellfire. So whatever God mercy you are, the day that God is ready for you, let's see how God mercy will hold you. <laughs> God mercy will not work. Jesus. So we are in the area of knowing God. You must also know God in the name of Jesus. Ask your neighbor, do you know God? What is his response? Okay. Those that do, you know the Bible says in Daniel 11 that he said those that do know their God, they shall do what? They shall be strong and they shall do exploits. When you know God, you'll be strong, you will do great exploits in the name of Jesus. Now, our time, we have to move very fast. The time is moving. We go to number two. Number two, obey his commandments. Job 36, 11, 12. You remember Job 36, 11, 12? You say? Number one is know the true God. That is number one. And the scripture for that is 1 Samuel 3, 1, 7 to 9. John 17, 2. You must know the true God. Then, number two, obey his commandments. Job 36, 11 to 12. John 14, 21 to 23. You must obey his ordinances. Now, when they say obey the commandments of God, some of us will just be thinking, the commandment of God is, is plenty. It's not just one. If you go to Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible, from 1 to 176, you will see the ordinance of God. I have said time without number. The, how many are there? There are seven. Are you getting it? The commandments. The covenant, the statute, the law, instruction, you understand? Then uh, covenant, you obey the seven. They are very important. They are the ordinance of God. If you read that scripture, the longest uh, verse in the in Psalm, Psalm 1, 119, 1 to 7. In fact, in my Bible, I call it the constitution of life. But all of them, you can call it the law of Christ. The whole of all, you call it simply the law of Christ. Obey the law of Christ. The law of Christ, how many law? Two. It's just two. You understand? What is the law of Christ? Jesus summarized the whole law and make it two. Number one is what? Love God with your spirit, soul, and body. And love your neighbor as yourself. That is the whole commandment. He summarized the whole. So we pray God help us in the mind. Tell more Jesus. So you must be obedient. Now, number three. Love your brothers. <laughs> love your brother, brother is very serious. And that you can see 1 John 4, 11 to 12. Number four. Don't love money. How many of us love money here? Money. <laughs> money is good. Money is a defense. The Bible said it. He said money answered all things. With money you can enjoy, you can do life. But the problem is when you love money more than God, there is a problem. In fact, you are not to love money. You can like money and all of that. You don't. Who are you supposed to love? God. Matthew 6, at 3, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. All other things will be added unto you. The word of God let us know in 1 uh, Timothy 6, verse 10. Apostle Paul wrote to his son Timothy. He said, my son Timothy, he said, oh man of God, he said, beware, the love of money is the root of all evil, which many coveted after. Are you getting? They covet after it. And because of that, they have gone off the faith. He now advised Timothy, he said, what you are supposed to follow? He said, follow after godliness. Godliness and contentment is great gain. Follow after godliness, righteousness, patience. All those things, the fruit of the spirit, those are the things you're supposed to pursue. He was admonishing uh, Timothy, his son. So we should desist. All this, the spirit of mammon, start pursuing money. People can do anything for money. They can kill for money. You see people doing money ritual. If you look at the news today, you see all manners of things. Some small, small boys like this, they went and killed one of their girlfriends and all of that for money. They want to do rituals, small boys. 
Yahoo boys, you hear of different kind of things. Doing all manners of things. All the grace to get rich quickly. If you get that money, what are you going to use it to do? You want to use it to build church? Or to do what? You want to oppress people? Eh? Are you going to carry it up, uh, to heaven? So those things, we should not pursue vanity. Bible call it vain glory. In Philippians uh, 2, you see vain glory. Vain glory, pursuing vanity. It's like you are pursuing the wind. Don't you know that money grow wings and fly? Money. By the time you have money through the wrong means, through unrighteous means, it will grow wing and fly. You will not know how it goes. Don't you see some former rich people? Have you not seen them? This man used to be very rich. Now he's no longer rich. What happened to them? Something happened. You see how this man that was very rich, but he's no longer rich again. You say, what happened to him? Something happened. The riches have grown wings and fly away. Who is the owner of all the money? Is it not God? The word of God said in Haggai 2, 8. He said, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. A cattle on a thousand, he belongs to me. Everything belongs to God. He gives to whosoever he wants to give to. So you see it. So we have to be mindful. We should have to be careful. We pray God, give us on Sunday the mind, tell them Jesus. That is why as a man of God, Hayala, money should not be, be a problem to you. Are you getting it? You should not covet after money. You should not. You must undermine money. You must make money your slave. Any money that comes to you, you must be, you'll be able to give it out to kingdom's work. Any money that comes to you. Any money you cannot give out. Are you getting it? You don't have the capacity to receive such money. You are not going to get it back. Any money you cannot give out. So that is why you see some people, some pastors are even poor because they don't distribute. If you don't distribute money, you don't give out, you don't give things, I know that you will be poor. You can be a pastor and be a poor pastor. You can have the Holy Spirit and be poor. You know that? Was uh, Lazarus not with the Holy Spirit? Lazarus. Saw all over his body. Plus Holy Spirit saw was all over his body. And he was a poor man. Lazarus. He died. He made it to heaven. Is that how you want to be? So you see it. So that is because if I have the Holy Spirit, you can be with the Holy Spirit and you are poor. That is why some Christians today, you see them. They are poor. They don't have this. And they are just... And they Holy Spirit. So, baby, Holy Spirit. What number have I said? The battery. Number four. Okay, number four. We said the love of money. Do not love money. Number five. Do not love worldliness. Woo! James 4 verse 4, you are familiar with that. You don't have to be a friend of this world. Covetousness, all manners of things. Burubia, everything, one chop, you alone. We have to be careful with the man. Hey, tell me Jesus. You are eating with your two hands and your legs, everything, you. Your neighbor is not eating. You are not giving to people. You are not a distributor. Huh? Number six, be honest. Woo! If you are a lover of God, you must be a honest man. You must be a man of integrity. Who is a man of integrity? Who is honest? Hayala. You remember in Acts 6? In Acts, we are told, in Acts, they said they should look for honest men. He said, look for honest men. People that are honest, that are of good report to handle the business of a certain business they want to give them. And who are the people they selected? Stephen. Stephen was a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen was a man that is honest. He has honest report. He's able to give true report. This is somebody that does not cut corners. So that is how we are supposed to be in the man. Hey, tell more Jesus. We have to be sincere. We have to be truthful. We have to do the needful in the man. Hey, tell more Jesus. That is what read in Acts 6 verse 3 for us so that we enjoy it. Then we go to number 7. You see, it's seven men of honest report, full of Holy Ghost and wisdom, who may appoint over this business. So, if you are a lover of God, you must be a honest person. So, for you to handle things in the mind, in the mind of Jesus. Now, number seven. We'll be stopping here, number seven. 
You have to manifest the, the fruit of the Spirit. You have to be patient. You have to be kind. You have to be humble. You have to be fruitful. Uh, you have to be truthful. You have to be righteous. Galatians 5 verse 22. Ephesians 5 verse 9. All of this, you have to manifest it. My eternal Lord Jesus. So by the time you do all this, then you know your love for God will increase it. My eternal Lord Jesus. Because of want of time, we'll be stopping here. You see, a true lover of God must desire the things of God. You must love God and you must desire the things of God. And that's why you hear David. He said, when they say, let's go to the house of God, I was glad. Are you glad when they talk of God? Are you glad when the word of God, they are discussing the word of God? When people are saying evil about your father's kingdom, are you happy? You understand? When they are saying evil, do you react and say, stop, don't say that kind of thing and all of that? You see it. You have to be able to defend your kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus. In closing, in the world today, there are a lot of people we hear of Godfatherism. What is Godfatherism? People having Godfather say, that man is my Godfather. That man is this. is my connection. He will help me. It's very wrong. There is only one God, one true God you have. And that is the living God, our heavenly father. There is no other God for that reason. You must not look unto man as your God. Are you getting it? Like I've said time again and again, I said, oh yeah, boy, it's my lifetime method. Are you getting it? It's my spiritual daddy, it's my father. Is he my God? He's not my God. Are you getting it? Man cannot be your God. Like I am now, I cannot be your God. Are you getting it? A man cannot be... The word of God says in Jeremiah 17 verse 5. He said, cause me any man that trusts in man, that consider flesh as his arm. If man become your weapon, then you are a problem. It's a big problem. So you see it. So God, for that reason, we should stop it. Don't begin